we, we have all been sitting down for a long time this morning listening to these wonderful presentations and I think we should all stand up now and just do some breathing exercises because being human beings we've all sat badly uh, for all this time. Um, so some breathing exercises if you'd like to put your um, one hand on your chest, uh, el pecho, and one hand estomajo, si? ¿sí? Estomajo, gracias. Um, and with me, fill up your estomajo. So go. And go. Otra vez. Ultima. Good. Now we have got some oxygen in our system. You can sit down, but if you want to walk around during my presentation, uh, that is terrific. Or if you want to take a coffee or visit the bathroom, that's fine with me. We make this very, very informal. So I saw the, the, the name Ken Robinson come up a couple of times this morning, and I'm a great, great fan of Ken Robinson. So I just thought I would start with my favorite story of Ken Robinson's. I, I, I have taken this from him totally. This is complete plagiarism. But it's such a wonderful story, and it relates to many of the things that we have been talking about this morning. And the story is about a teacher, this lady teacher, and she's I'm getting a nod from Maria at the back there. Um, and this lady teacher is teaching very young children, about five years of age. And she's always had problems with this one little girl who never seems to focus very much. But the exercise that, he, that she has given them is to draw anything from their imagination, anything they want from their imagination. And she notices that this little girl is totally focused, totally concentrated on this, on this assignment, on this activity of drawing. So it, it gets her interest. She goes up to her and she tries to look over to see what she's doing. And she says to her, what are you drawing? And she says, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher says, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the little girl says, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> Which is a wonderful example of the imagination of children and the imagination and the creativity of artists as well. I'm really thrilled to be here. I congratulate Reina uh, Escuela Superior de Musica uh, for having this initiative, bringing us all together, creating an opportunity really for us to have some dialogue for the future. So Esther and Marjorie, thank you so much for all the work that you have poured into this, into this project. What I would like to do today is, uh, is to complement many of the presentations we have already heard. Uh, Elisa and Maria in particular, you in a way have um, set the whole thing up for me so, so very, very well. And I would like to give you some reflection based upon my work directly with students. So that's my objective today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my experience, but Alvaro gave a, a wonderful exposition of that right at the start. So I'm basically a, a cultural manager and have been for my entire career, always in music, always in the performing arts. So I have run major symphony orchestras uh, about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I moved into higher education, which is the same continuum, it's the same uh, part of, of the industry, it's just a different different bit of it. I was the president of New England Conservatory of Music in Boston and I had a wonderful, really wonderful and creative time there. And I came back to 
Europe in 2015 decided uh, to live uh, in Valencia, which is one of the best cities, I think, in, in the whole of Spain. And um, the consultancy that I've created there uh, has meant that I work a great deal uh, across um, America um, with Curtis, uh, USC, Rice University, uh, Eastman School, and also a, a great deal in, uh, in Europe as well. And I do everything from mentoring and coaching to consultancy work for strategic planning, fundraising, new programs, new curriculum, wh whatever it might be. Uh, and it has given me a really uh, fascinating insight as to what's happening across the entire world. So when I talk about the students, I'm talking about the students from all of the places that, uh, that I have experienced. And I've also worked for the Association of European Conservatoires, and I recently did a major project with them and five uh, conservatories in Europe, uh, the Sibelius Academy in Helsinki, the Royal Academy, Academy of Music in, uh, in Aarhus, Denmark, um, the Royal Conservatory in The Hague, uh, the Oslo um, Academy in Norway, and the Guildhall School of Music, and it was basically all about musical entrepreneurship and assessing that and seeing where classical music is and how it's developing. And I'd be delighted to send that report to you. It's a public report. I even have a, a little tiny bit of a website on an EU page somewhere, which I, I've never been on before. So, so now I'm, I'd, like, I'd like to reflect on many of uh, the conversations that I have had with students. Sometimes those conversations have been one-on-one, -on -one, just the two of us in a room talking. Sometimes it's been in a group like this. And I always start by setting them an exercise. And I think, Elisa, you will relate to this exercise very, very well. Uh, and the exercise is to make them think. Because everyone is so unbelievably busy practicing, going to orchestra, going to choir, going to opera, uh, attending theory, history, whatever it might be. But to get people to stop and to reflect and to think about where they are is essential. So for this exercise, I do this. I ask them to interview each other. So an entrevista, see? Um, and it takes them a little few minutes to get into that. But it's very fascinating because they really open up to each other and then they report back to everyone else as to what they have discovered of each other. So I've done, the whole of my PowerPoint is, is in uh, uh, Spanish, so if I've got some of this wrong or you start giggling because there's an accent in the wrong place, I'll understand. So this is the first question I asked them. And it's fascinating to hear their response to that. This is something they take unbelievably seriously. They're incredibly critical of themselves and their place in their environment, in their conservatory. I would say on average, people give themselves around a seven out of 10. The only, the only uh, change to that was when I, when I was teaching on the East Coast, most of the students gave themselves 11 out of 10. <laughs> but that's the East Coast. Then I asked them about their past, about what they have discovered about themselves. And they start to slow down at this point because they haven't yet thought about it. And yet it's a very important question for them to know. And now this one, abilidades, skills. And I have to keep reminding them what a skill is because they will make a skill into, um, well, I'm fun to be with. No, that's not a skill. That's, that's a characteristic. That's a trait. What are your hard skills? Because this is one of the most important questions for anyone 
to ask themselves, what are your skills? You're basically saying, this is what I can contribute to the world. This is what is going to make me employed. And employment, after all, is a major objective of what we are all trying to do with our students. So eventually they, they warm up to this one and they can understand what a skill is. And it's very interesting as you dig down you, for them to actually come up with, well, I can speak Russian or I can, um, I can draw. And th these are skills that they haven't yet hasn't yet haven't yet surfaced in their thinking and yet skills that will enable them to create opportunities for themselves uh, in the future and staying with the reflection then uh, what are your traits rascos and i let them expand on that how many traits they they would like how it's basically this exercise is how do people how do i think people see me how do they experience me and then objectives and it's probably the first time that anyone has said what are your objectives if i ask these questions of undergraduate students th for them that future possibility of having an objective of having a plan for the future is light years away. For graduate students, they can feel the reality coming towards them and they are already asking these questions of themselves. What is my plan for the future? Then what are their values? So we're really getting into um, 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 into who they are, who they, how they see themselves. What is it that makes them tick? What is it that sustains them as human beings? And then the last two questions. Now they have thought about this. They don't know the answer to it yet. They have they don't know about audience engagement. They don't know about society yet. They are still in this amazing bubble called the conserva conservatoire, which we have all created for them. They are away from all of that. It's out there, but they know it's out there somewhere. All they can, how the way that they respond to this is they respond to it with feelings. They know that music is important. They know that music is transformational and they know that they want to communicate that. And they need to be given the door or the key to allow them to unlock that possibility in their own lives in the way that they will contribute to society. I think without doing this exercise, everything else in terms of developing uh, a career and developing uh, social media and networks and uh, your website and all of those things fall to nothing. You have to begin with a foundation and this is the foundation of reflection and self-knowledge. This is how it begins. And the, re the response I've had from students doing this all over the world now is really very, very strong. And then they follow up with me. And I'm very happy to, to speak with them, very happy to answer emails. And you feel that they have started a journey, a journey of discovery. Oh, it's this one. So millennials, that's who we're teaching. Uh, who are they? What are they? They're unbelievably creative. They're young people. Everything is possible. The world is theirs. They just need to take it from us and get on with it. They're optimistic about absolutely everything. 
They're optimistic about their programs. They love their teachers. Their teachers are the most important people, more important than their, than their parents. They, they love their school. There's a belief in all of their friends and all of their friends are going to help them for the future. They work really, really hard. They really enjoy that. They're committed, totally committed to their art. And you all produce excellent musicians. These are musicians who can compete with anyone in the world. And what do they aspire to in all of this? They want to be musicians. That's how they want to be seen in the world. They want to be employed as musicians. They see opportunity as being out there. That opportunity will come to them because they have worked very hard and they have practiced and they can play very well. What I say to them is playing excellently is the default expectation. That's where everything begins with excellence. You need more than that. You need more skills to give you that edge which makes you even more special. They believe that all you need is an agent, uh, a representante, who will come and choose you. I'm going to put lots of resources into you as a young artist and give you a fantastic career. Or I'm going to win a competition. Um, and I've seen so many young musicians uh, push themselves through that. And so many young musicians who come second in the competition. And when you come second in the competition, you may as well not have even shown up. Nobody wants to know you. You maybe get a couple of engagements, one engagement with a, uh, an orchestra far, far away. Um, it, everyone is only interested in the person who wins, the winner. That's how we see things. And that's a huge waste of energy and, and, and talent. Uh, I, I always say to, um, to young artists, you shouldn't focus on that. You should focus upon being the agent of your own career. You are managing your own career. It's not being managed for you. You create the opportunities. And they will say, well, how do you get the opportunities? And this will relate to the next sections of this, of this um, very simple uh, PowerPoint presentation. You get those through people that you meet, but hopefully you get them through your conservatoire. Because I think that that is our responsibility to the employability of our students. And if we take a look at uh, employability, if we take a look at what are the opportunities out there for everyone, I didn't even start with soloist, because the soloist thing uh, is right at the, the top of the cream of the cream of the cream of young artists. So few people will be accepted as a, a soloist and then sustain a career for the future. It's unbelievably difficult to sustain a career as a soloist. You see people flash in, they flash out. Uh, how many of those artists that we had seen um, in, in recent years are still there? I was talking to Julia Fisher, if you know, violinist, and I was talking to her and um, she, she studied um, in Germany and she was part of a class of 10 people who had been designated as soloists for the future, world-class soloists for the future. And she said out of the 10, after all of these years, she says it's her and uh, Batyashvili are the only two who now have sustained a career and are known. And the others, she said, they have just disappeared. So that's why I haven't included uh, soloists, but I have included orchestra. 
An orchestra is uh, very attractive to young artists, but there are so few opportunities. How many vacancies are there in one orchestra each season? Five? As many as that. Uh, when I ran the Minnesota Orchestra, we had a vacancy in our, in our cello section. Uh, just one vacancy. And we had 180 applications for it worldwide. 180 applications. And eventually 40 people were invited to come and audition based upon the recordings that they had sent at their own expense. And sometimes those auditions would last four minutes. People had come from Australia or Russia or wherever it was. Unbelievably competitive. And the same is true of opera. For a young singer to get into an opera company, you have to do that whole apprenticeship thing. Uh, go into a young artist program, uh, try and, and, and cover some of the, the, the smaller roles, hopefully then cover some of the more major roles. But what an apprenticeship that is. Th this is, fr I used autonomo, I think you say freelance. I, I didn't realize that you had freelance. Um, but working as, as, as a freelance, um, pulling together uh, a lot of, of different types of work from teaching through to um, doing concerts all over the place. Um, it's a way of pulling together as many income streams as you can. And that attracts the, the mixed economy. I think that teaching is unbelievably important within that mix. And I'll say a bit more about that in, in a moment. And then, they, and then young artists haven't yet thought about what happens in 30 years' time. You wouldn't necessarily expect them to. But if you are not thinking about that, and if you're not thinking about that arc of our lives and where our lives will, will lead, if you don't have fixed employment, if somebody is not contributing into your pension program, um, then you have problems further down the line. And people need to be aware of that in terms of making their own plans. So what opportunities? Um, what oppor op opportunities are there? I'm gonna take uh, um, the life of a pianist, for instance. Uh, Esther inspired this one uh, in me. Um, so if you, if you think about a pianist, what work does a pianist have? Or does every pianist um, give recitals? Chopin and Beethoven, that's, that's what they do. Or are there a ton of other opportunities that they, can, that they can look at? They can look at being a repetiteur with an opera company. They can look at playing for a ballet company. They could look at working in uh, a church. They could look at being a pianist for a choir. And do we prepare them for that? Or do we keep them within the fantasy of being a solo pianist? They can also accompany. When I was in Boston, I used to talk about the importance of accompanying to my piano faculty. And they couldn't hear it. I couldn't understand this. Uh, Alfred Brendel accompanies. He loves accompanying. Uh, Polini accompanies. It, is, is, this some, is there something wrong with them? Is this evil? Is this the dark side of music? Oh no, it's Chopin and Beethoven. And they would look into, into the middle distance as far as that was concerned. Incredibly difficult to make people look at other opportunities and to allow people to have the skills to be good at these things and to be employed and to have artistic development in their own lives. So where is this work? What are the skills that you need to try and find all of these things? What is happening in the music world? There, I refer to it as the music industry and it most definitely is 
a music industry. You've seen some of the figures quoted this morning. Billions of dollars worth, billions of euros go into this huge industry of employment and activity and creativity and all of those, all of those very good things. Trying to understand that and trying to understand how you can get into this is incredibly important. And also understanding where it is economically. Is it expanding? Is it contracting? Is it staying the same? Because that will determine where you want to work, who you want to work with, what your skills are to produce that work. Do you want to stay in your home country? Do you want to go to the other uh, 27 EU countries that you, is permissible for you to go and work in. Where does all this happen? And how competitive is it? Nothing is going to fall in your lap. Everything has to be striven for, has to be worked for. So for me, the... Um, skills that I think are absolutely essential, the skills that I think every single conservatory should be teaching, and this is just some of them, I just put s s down some of my favorites here. Um, th this, is, this, is my, this is my short list. Teaching. Teaching is so important. Teaching well is so noble. And every single musician, if they become a professional musician, will teach. Every single professional musician will teach. Yasha Heifetz taught. Everyone will teach. So you have to be good at it. You have to have this as a skill. And somebody needs to show you how to be a good teacher. You need practical demonstration. You need to be taken in and shown what you do wrong and what you do right and how you can develop. You've got to be a really good communicator. You have to be able to tell your story. When I work with students, and I love working with the students uh, here uh, at Arena Sofia, uh, and also at, at Berkeley in Valencia, uh, they're very, very open to these things. But I, I get, in, in communication classes, I get people up to tell their story for three minutes. Everyone has a story. You haven't got to rehearse it. Everyone has at least one story in their heads. And you get them up, and they're always very, very nervous, and they normally freeze like this, so that all their breathing goes terribly wrong. They don't breathe from here, they breathe from up here, and it's very, very shallow. And then there's always one part of them that's incredibly tense. And normally it's a leg, or you see an arm doing this. Sometimes, when they're speaking, they actually back away slowly from the audience, because they're frightened of, of the audience. And then they avoid eye contact. And Eyes are incredibly important because if you don't communicate with your eyes, if you don't make a connection with your eyes, you can't speak, really. You can't communicate effectively. I believe people say that the eyes are the window to the soul. I think that the eyes, and why we're so fascinated by eyes, is, it, is because they are the only liquid part of our body. So we're looking into liquid, and we make assessments because of that liquid quality. And we're very good at making quick assessments. So getting them to speak, getting them to tell their story. Uh, I experimented here at Reina Sofia, um, because you have so many students that are from all sorts of nationalities. So I got a, a student from Azerbaijan, and also another student from Poland to tell their story in their native language. And I said to the audience of students, I said, you will understand what they are saying. Nobody spoke Polish and nobody spoke Russian. But because they became confident, very confident in their own language, they communicated something. And they were absolutely amazed when the audience told them what they were talking about. 
I can't explain it. That's, that was my experience. You have to do this in order to make your pictures. In order, if you've got that one tiny moment when you're in a room with somebody really important to say who I am and that I'd love to have coffee with you. How do you create that in 30 seconds or 90 seconds or 60 seconds? This is really, really important. And you can only do it if you've been through some of these exercises and you know who you are. You've got to be organized. You've got to be able to organize your time. You've got to be able to organize your computer. You've got to be able to organize your database. You've got to be able to organize um, how you see the entire week. So you wake up each day and you know what you want to achieve. This is, uh, I saw you also use the word network. So that was, I didn't realize that. So I would hacer un mantener contactos en las industrias musicales. So what, network. Networking, that's a prime responsibility of every single student. And so many students throw it away because they don't know about it. Networking at your school is so easy. Obviously, you're going to network with your contemporaries, with your peers, with your classmates. But network with your teachers. Network with your teachers' friends, with their colleagues, with the administration, with the head of the school, with the people who engage you to do social events, with people who give you concert experience, with the summer festivals that you get invited to, to attend. Make certain that you know who these people are and you have their t contact information. And I recommend to every single student, and I say this is unbelievably old-fashioned, I don't care, but it's really effective, you have a business card. You have to have a business card. Berkeley insists upon that, you have business cards um, with all of your students. And you see them, Ooh, business card. Pfft, something old people do. Um, I tell you, the alternative, that's the way I say it to them, you'll be in a really great situation, a wonderful opportunity. Opportunity lasts in the moment. It's only in the moment. If you've got to write out your contact information on a scrappy piece of paper and give it to somebody, it will first of all look unbelievably unprofessional and secondly, it will mean nothing because they'll lose it. You have to be professional and give people something that's beautifully designed and you have to be able to tell them something about your card as you hand it over. When I hand over my card, I, which I'm happy to do to all of you, um, but the story I always, I always tell is uh, this is a card that was designed for me by three of my friends who are only 26 years old and they asked me all these difficult questions about who are you? What are you doing? What do you want to achieve for the future? Because we'll help design something for you if we know those things about you. Have you thought about it? That's my business card. Now, having told you that little story, when you look at my business card, it hasn't got my photograph on it, but you will see me just because of that story. That, those little techniques about having your network and then creating a da da database that ensures that you have put all that contact information in your database. And then what on earth do you do with the database? Do you write to them every day? Do you say to them, uh, um, I need your advice or I need money? H how do you go about working your database? And you go about doing that by um, developing a relationship. People should hear from you on a regular basis. Not every day, not every week, but every few weeks. You might send a copy of a recent uh, video of you performing. You might ask for their advice about something. You might send them an article which you think could be of interest to them. And you personalize the whole thing so that when it does come to the day, and people will look at that for what? Three seconds, two seconds, four seconds? Uh, which is the normal, the normal expanse of time people devote to things these days. But if you do that, it'll come to a time when you want to sit down with somebody and you want to say to them, could you help me with this?
I need your advice. And everything is warm up, warmed up because of that. Because you have taken those, those uh, relationships really seriously. Digital marketing. Uh, love it or hate it, it's with us and it's not going to go away. You need to know it. You need to know how to do it. You need to be expert in it. You need to get your messaging right. You need to know who you are. Then you put yourself out there. Then you spend a lot of time taking down all those photographs of yourself doing silly things that don't help your image that happened all those years past. Then you might think of una marca, uh, your brand. And then understanding and using technology. So many students I've sat down with um, don't even have a laptop. This is the world we live in is about technology. We have to give that to our students and they have to understand it. They need to be trained in it. They need not just to be able to be really good at using their, their laptop or their, uh, their iPhone, um, but they have to be able to make recordings on it and have basic technological skills that will really help them. You need languages. So many uh, singers I have sat down and said, okay, how's your Italian? Oh, well, I don't speak Italian. Well, you need to by the end of next week. You need to be fluent in Italian because the repertoire is in Italian or German or French. It's not in Spanish and it's not in English. Tiny little corners are, you got to get it right. Writing. You have to be able to express yourself in writing. You, you don't have to be able to write uh, um, War and Peace, but you do need to be able to write about yourself and express your ideas and communicate just as you're communicating your stories. Now what's interesting about this list is that a lot of conservatories now offer some of these as programs, some of these as courses. But they're never offered as part of the culture. They're never offered as part of who we are. They're offered as an option. They're offered, you can do this, you can sign up to this, we have these interesting people coming and talking and, and, and explaining this and that, and you can come in and out of it whenever you want. Instead, they say it's far more important, your studio lesson, orchestra, theory, harmony, history of music. And it, it's like the um, immutability, it's about the immutability of the curriculum. And I think our curriculum now, it seems very obvious to say it, but our curriculum needs to reflect the world in which we live and the world in which our students will be employed. And when you say that, that immutability of curriculum, and I, I've broken many swords trying to change curriculum, uh, and I wish I had done it better, but there are chances for this to happen and opportunities for it to happen. Because what I feel, and I certainly feel it in this room, is that you're probably in agreement with me or some of what I'm saying. And if you're thinking that, there are other people who are thinking that as well. And it's a question of getting some consensus going as to what could change which would make the art form that we love and cherish even more relevant and accessible and important in a world which is going mad. Yeah? And, th and this last one, is that me about to explode? No? You've got to be able to do that stuff. I hate doing that stuff, but you've got to be able to do it. It's about money. We're nearly at the end now. Um, the history of conservatories is unbelievable. Uh, the history of conservatories is about this incredibly rich culture that we are responsible for. 
that we manage, which we teach. The, the, where music is, where classical music is, it's, it's very rich, it's very deep, but it's very narrow. And it's expanding that narrowness. Estrecho, that's narrow, isn't it? Estrecho. It's very narrow. And we want, I think, to keep the quality, keep the depth, but expand it. Uh, and Sanchi, is it in Sanchi? Expand. Conservatories are conservative. That's, I think, why we're called conservatories. And were full of myths and legends. My teacher studied with somebody who studied with Liszt. Well, how can you argue with that? I mean, it's like saying, I had lunch with God last week, and you can't argue with somebody who has that experience. I think sometimes it will be wonderful, this is, this is going to be heresy to many people, if we could have a training program for faculty so that we can expand some of the horizons for faculty, so that not just teaching the myths and legends and the repertoire and all of those good things, but they're actually tel telling their students about contemporary life. And so many don't do that. I will acknowledge many, many do as well. Changing a culture is, is incredibly important. There's an um, expression, um, a maxim that, that's, uh, that I, I know, which is um, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a question of how you change the culture. How it's not about wars and it's not about revolution. It's about the gentle act but decisive act of conversation and discussion. Because then we might be able to answer the last question, which is, are we giving our students what they need? Or are we training them for jobs that are disappearing? I think that's the last one. Hold on. Yep. So I'll leave that one up. Thank you very much. <laughs>